اعوذ باللہ السمیع العلیم من الشیطان اللعین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والحمد للہ اللذی جعلنا من المتمسکین بولایت امیر المؤمنین ولائمت المعصومین علیہم السلام والحمد للہ اللذی ہدانا لہذا وما کننا لنہتدی لولا انہدان اللہ ثم الصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین خاتم النبیین شفیع المذنبین حبیب الہ العالمین بالقاسم مصطفی محمد اللہم صلی علی محمد وعلی وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على عدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما يريد الله ليذهب عنكم الرجس أهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا اللهم أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no doubt that it's due to His kindness and generosity that we get opportunities such as these where we gather in remembrance of Him, tabaraka wa ta'ala. Next we send our congratulatory messages to our 12th and living Imam, Imam al-Hujjah, jalallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad and to each and every one of you as we are gathered to celebrate the wilada to the birth anniversary of our 11th Imam, the father of our 12th Imam, Imam Hassan al-Askari alayhi abdalus salatu was salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Naturally before we begin um, let us remember the shuhada who died yesterday today um, in Pakistan in the Sindh province who were um, cowardless, cowardly martyred um, while they were reciting Salatul Jum'ah at the mosque. It is said that about 50 have uh, died in this massacre or even more now with the number of casualties. Um, let us remember them with the Surah Al-Fatiha. <laughs> As we discussed today in Juma Salat, you know that <coughs> these people, our fellow brothers and sisters who live in environments such as these, you know, where um, to be a practicing Shia can cost you your life. Yeah? And yet that does not stop them yeah, from going to masajid, going to mosques where they know their lives will be in danger. These are heroes, you know. These are people who are keeping um, the the faith strong and they're not afraid of the consequences that will come. We have minus 20 degree weather and we're half of us are at home today, you know. Um, we should be lucky, we should be thankful how lucky we are um, and how fortunate we are that we don't have to live in this type of environment of constant threat and constant violence. Um, and this is something that inshallah God will reward them abundantly for. It ties into my second point. I was hoping we would have more people today, to be quite honest. Yeah, this is a good crowd. It's not a bad crowd. Yeah, mashallah to you for coming. But it's the 11th Imam's Wiladat. You know, I mean, you add that with it being on a Friday night. You add that with it that if we look in the calendar of the month of Rabi al Akhir, this is the only event there is in the whole month. Yeah, and if we can't come for an only event in the whole month, you know. Um, we have to re-examine certain things, inshallah, and we hope that um, people will re-examine. It's easy to feel lazy. I don't blame anybody for wanting to feel lazy when in the comfort of your home you can take out popcorn, grab a soda, and watch a mudlis. Because I know that's what they're doing, right? Because they're not watching a movie. They're watching me, right? Um, yeah. I mean, but uh, there's nothing like coming together as a brotherly environment. There's nothing like mosque tea, as they say, right? The masid nuchai is masid nuchai, yeah? Um, so, inshallah, we, we hope that people will um, take this motivation to come, inshallah. 
اللهم صل على When we discuss the life of our 11th Imam alayhi salam, you know, it is one of these Imams that we've spent quite a bit discussing his life. If you remember, over the last two or three years, when the, um, the events of his commemoration or celebration come, I've tried to exclusively discuss the life of our Imam without tying another topic to it, um, with the purpose that he's the father of our living Imam. Yeah? So we get to know him better. And the later as the Imams go, the 9th, 10th, and 11th, we really don't know much about these Imams. right? We know up to the 8th Imam maybe, um, but after that there's not much information. And specifically when it comes to our 11th Imam, We've described he only lived for 28 years, so the information about him is not that much. And his imamate lasted six years. Um, so from the age of 22 to 28, he was the imam of the time. But during that time, the situation was absolutely tumultuous. Um, in that life of 28 years, they say five or six Abbasid Khalifas came into power one killing the other, or the Turkish uh, soldiers who are now part of the Muslim army, who are the ones who are actually controlling the show, are actually killing the Abbasid Khalifas to make sure somebody else comes into power um, who will be in line with their thinking. Yeah? Kind of reminds of the US government in Saudi Arabia, isn't it? Yeah? That the, the king in power will be one who is in line with the thinking of the United States. Um, but when you look at the economic life, the economic life um, is almost kind of like the life that we have today in the sense that the rich were extremely rich and the rest were poor and there was no middle class really. Um, and the, the lovers of the Ahlul Bayt were prob predominantly those who were in the lower bracket of lower class. The political life we described with the, the Turks and the Abbasid Khalifa's constant turnover. Um, we've also discussed some of the famous letters that the Imam has written. The last time, I think it was his um, wafat last month, when we discussed um, the letter that he wrote to Ibn Babaway, Al-Qummi, isn't it? And the beautiful advice that the Imam salam, gave us in that letter. Uh, but all of these things were happening in the course of the Imam's life, describing to us the difficulty of that period. Right? Um, we find that alongside the economic um, problems that were happening, the political problems that were happening, there were also a lot of um, religious difficulties or different ideologies coming into the fold. A lot of this drama, you can say, or a lot of this um, difficulties were the fact that the Abbasid Khulafa knew that there will be a 12th Imam. There's nobody could deny that hadith. So we find that during the imamate of the of our 11th imam and even the first few years of ghaybat e sughra the house of the imam was constantly in turmoil. Yeah? Constant searches anytime that they wanted, constant invasion into those houses to see if this boy was there, if this boy had been born yet. All of these things were constantly happening. During the time of our 11th imam there was great difficulty from um, different religious influences that were taking place within the fold of Islam as well. So on one end, you had, for example, the people who really despised the Ahlul Bayt And these were the people who would invent hadith, would invent ideologies, would spread rumors about the Imams, that the Imams were somebody else, for example, or the Imams were cut off. Um, all of these things were part of the daily ritual, you can say, that the Imam had to go through in defense of the true madhab. Likewise, you would find an, um, an influx of atheists and agnostics coming to the Imam constantly to debate with him, or not necessarily to the Imam, but to the public. And then you would find that the Imam would have to take that role of explanation and defense. Furthermore, you found that during this time now, because the Islamic empire had spread so vast that Christians and Christian monks had begun to come into the Abbasid government. You find some of the doctors that the Abbasid Khulafa would use were Christians and Christian monks actually would prescribe for them um, remedies, spiritual remedies to cure them. And so the Imam salam had this you can say attack from all sides that he had to figure out a way to defend himself. And the difficulty of all of this, if you remember, that the six and a half years that the Imam was the Imam of the time, he spent majority of that time either in prison or house arrest. Yeah? That means the communication was very limited as well. And um, most of the communication would happen through letters. You do find some incidences that we'll mention right now of actual visitations. but. 
if, if we want to get a good glimpse at who the Imam is, if you look at books of history, um, a good book in English is the book written by Bakir Qarashi Marhum. It's found on al-islam.org. He's written um, a, a book on every Imam. So uh, you can order this, the 14 series, 14 set book. Um, and it comes as a nice set. But uh, one on the 14 Masumins is each one. That's the best one we have in English. One of the best ones we have in English. And pretty um, in detail um, that he's described. Um, there's a beautiful section within that which, which says the letters that was written by the Imam. So it's just letters that he wrote. He wrote to people in Qom, he wrote to people in different areas describing to him messages that he wanted passed on to his Shia. Yeah? And this is a beautiful aspect or a beautiful way we can gauge or learn to see what the Imam wanted from us. Because he, was, he wasn't given the opportunity yeah, to do the type of tabligh that the fifth and the sixth Imam wasalam, were given. An example of a visitation, this is a very interesting example. It ties in with the fact that there were religious difficulties that were happening at the time of the Imam. Amongst the people who existed at that time was a person by the name of Ishaq al-Kindi. Ishaq al-Kindi, um, this hadith is a, is a beautiful hadith and is found in these books of history, of history as well. It appears, for example, in Al-Manaqib, volume 4, page 424. I'll read briefly in Arabic, but it's a very interesting um, dilemma that the Imam salam had to deal with. It says, "Anna Ishaq al-Kindi kana fayla suf al-Iraq fi zamanihi." Ishaq al-Kindi was a famous philosopher in Iraq, yeah, um, of his time, one of the most famous philosophers of that time. Most philosophers are problematic, yeah. Because it's difficult, uh, in the sense, philosophers prefer no answers but open-ended questions. And that's what confuses the masses most of the time. So Ishaq al-Kindi was a famous philosopher of Iraq at that time. أَخَذَ فِي تَعَلِيفِ تَنَاقُضِ الْقُرْآنِ وَشَغَلَ نَفْسِهِ بِهِ He took upon him the task of writing a book about the contradictions found in the Qur'an. تَنَاقُضِ yeah? الْقُرْآنِ So he, um, living in Iraq, being around Muslims, got it in his head somehow that the Quran was full of contradictions. Yeah? So he began, in the, he began a task of writing a book describing the contradictions of the Quran. It so happened that a few of the students of Ishaq al-Kindi came to visit the Imam of our time, Imam Hassan al-Askari alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Amman wa ali Muhammad. So when they came to visit the Imam salam, he knew that these were the students of Ishaq al-Kindi. So the Imam took the opportunity and he says to them, أَمَا فِيكُمْ رَجُلٌ رَشِيدٌ يَرْدَعُ أُسْتَاذَكُمْ وَالْكِنْدِي أَمَّا أَخْذَ فِيهِ مِنْ تَشَاغُلِهِ بِالْقُرْآنِ He says, are any one of you strong enough, courageous enough, rightly guided enough yeah, to challenge your teacher in what he is saying? Yeah? Are any of you, do any of you have the guts to do so? Basically what the Imam alayhi salam is asking them. And they replied back and said, نَحْنُ مِنْ تَلَامِذَتِهِ كَيْفَ يَجُوزُ مِنَّا لِلْتِعْرَاذْ عَلَيْهِ فِي هَذَا أَوْ فِي غَيْرِهِ He says, we are the students of Ishaq. What right do we have of contradicting our teacher? Now this is a problem right away. Yeah, this is a problem right away. And this is something that we can read one of two ways. One way we can read that is that they had the respect for the teacher. But you know the respect of the teacher goes so far as as long as he's not talking batil. Yeah? Um, if he was talking about something else is different. He's talking about contradictions in the Quran. Doesn't matter who your teacher is. We don't, we, there's a line that we draw, right? And this is where we come to a, a problem that I think exists in our society today. And it's existed, I'm sure, for quite some time. We take personalities as our gods. Yeah? In the sense that if we like somebody and we accept that they have more knowledge than we do, we take them as our teacher. And when we take them as our teacher, we put them in certain pedestals. And once we put them in certain pedestals, there is nothing that, that they will do or that they can say which will knock them off of that pedestal. So they could talk... Um, stuff that doesn't exist, yeah, that nobody believes in. Or it could be things that, for example, may exist but are so rare um, in their precedence that nobody has accepted them. But we don't refute it. 
Yeah? And this becomes a very dangerous thing where eventually we become brainwashed by them. Yeah? And this is something that I may have mentioned before. You know, I learned this the very hard way when I was in Hawza. It's very easy to take people of knowledge as our role models. Right? And we should. But as role models, we have to understand that they are not masoom. Yeah? And this is where we, we find it a very difficult thing to do. There were teachers that I would hold in such high pedestals, and then because they were bashar, because they were man, they would make mistakes. Yeah? Whether it would be akhlaqi mistakes, whether there would be something, who am I to judge? But the fact that I had kept them in such pedestals, I would get kicked in the gut every time they did something wrong. And it made me realize at that time that I'm not allowed to take somebody like that and keep them in that position and then I have such blinders or tunnel vision where I don't see the mistakes that they're making. Yeah? Because if I accept them as a human being, accept them and respect the status that they have, I will accept the mistakes that they make and it will not change my perception of them. Why? Because we are bashar, bashar yaktab. Human beings make mistakes. Yeah, we have to accept that human beings make mistakes, right? And so we, we I think we're in this day and age where we take somebody because they studied, for example, at a particular hausa in a particular city, and that in itself is hujja for me that uh, these people will never make mistakes. Yeah, or he studied an X number of years and he's wearing a turban. Ah, this guy is my imam. Yeah, um, of course not Imam Imam, but you know what I mean, right? That I'll take him and do whatever he says, and eventually you see, for example, we begin to dress differently, yeah, because he tells us to dress differently. It becomes like a cult almost, yeah. And today, unfortunately, in Toronto, we have many cults, yeah. We have many organizations which have become cultish, cultish, where people go in there and you don't see them again, unfortunately. We don't see them again. We see that their ideologies have begun to change. They come back to us with material that may exist. So for example, some may say that the tragedy of Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam never happened. Yeah? It's there. People are saying this. Yeah? Um, people will say that not all of our Imams are shuhada. Yeah? Only some are shaheed. Now these aqwal, my brothers and sisters, are found. Yeah? You find them in our books of history. But they are so rare. Yeah? They are so rare that the majority have ignored them. Yeah? And this is what we are following. Right? So these things that they are creating or that they are saying may have been found in certain books. Right? But how come 98% of our scholars have ignored them? Isn't that proof enough that it is something that's probably not true? Right? Otherwise the 98% what we're saying is 98% are wrong and 2% are right. Of ulama. Yeah? This is what I find very difficult when we contradict or when we challenge our maraja or, or, we, or I think that I've come up with a new theory that 1400 years of scholars were not smart enough to pick up, but I'm smart enough. Yeah? I'm the guy who got it. Yeah? And this is a mistake that we make. So we have to be very careful. And I think this is what the Imam salam here was highlighting to us. That look, don't be like these people who are blinded. The guy is talking about contradictions in the Quran. Yet they're like, well, how can we challenge him? He's our teacher. Right? We have to be very careful of this type of mentality and this type of ideology. So the Imam salam, being the Imam guided them. Yeah? And he said to them that if I am to give you a message for him, will you give it to him? Yeah? And they said, yes, we'll give it to him. But the Imam said, I have certain conditions. The first is you don't tell it is from me. Yeah? And there's hikmah behind this. Yeah? There's hikmah behind this. Um, don't tell him it's from me um, until after the fact. Secondly, don't go from your visit to me or, um, and right away begin to challenge your teacher because they'll know where it's come from. Yeah? He says, go back to your teacher, become comfortable with your teacher, yeah? uh, make him easy with you again, and then at that moment, I want you just to ask him a question. Yeah? So they said, okay, we'll do this. So when they went back, the Imam salam instructed them to ask the following question. And it's a very beautiful question. He says, In annaka hadha al-mutakallim bi hadha al-Qur'an In ataka hadha al-mutakallim bi hadha al-Qur'an Hal yajuzu an yakuna muraduhu bima takallama bihi minhu ghayra al-ma'ani allati kaddanantaha annaka He says that if the mutakallim of the Qur'an, yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد. So the Imam is saying that ask him, is it possible that this mutakallim, the speaker of the Quran, who has brought it to you, had intended by his speech other than that what you have understood from it? Is it possible? Yes. What do you think? Yes, of course it's possible, isn't it? Yeah? In my lecture to you, yeah, you may understand one point and you may understand a point altogether different. Right? It's because why? The speaker or the hearer will understand that which comes into his ear. And this is what the Imam says. The Imam says, I guarantee you, he'll tell you naam. It's possible. Why? إِنَّهُ مِنَ الْجَائِزِ لِأَنَّهُ رَجُلٌ يَفْهَمُ إِذَا سَمِعَ he says, because it is the man who is the listener who understands what he understands. Yeah? So it's definitely possible that the mutakallim of the Qur'an may have intended a different meaning to the Qur'an. So he says, if he replies you in this way, I want you to reply back to him and say, فَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّهُ قَدْ أَرَادَ غَيْرَ الَّذِي ذَهَبْتَ أَنْتَ إِلَيْهِ فَتَكُونَ وَتَكُونُ وَاضِعًا لِغَيْرِ مَعَانِي He says then how do you not know that it is you who have assigned a different meaning and created contradictions in the Qur'an other than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had intended? Yeah? You understand? Yeah? He said, you have taken a message, assumed this contradiction, assumed there are flaws in the Qur'an, but you have just said it is possible that he had a different meaning in mind. Yeah? This is why tafsir bir ra'i is haram. Haram. Yeah? To read the Qur'an and then interpret the Qur'an based on my own ideology, based on all my own thinking, based on my background is haram in Islam. Not, oh, don't do it. No, haram. There are traditions from the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his family. He said the lowest levels, the lowest seats of hell will be by those who interpret the Qur'an based on their own opinions. Yeah? This is what this person was doing. Yeah? We have to be very careful. This is why we leave tafsir or tafasir to the experts. There are, you know, when you study the ilmu tafsir, um, there are conditions that have to be in place before we can interpret the Qur'an knowledge, background, historical knowledge, Arabic grammar knowledge, all of these knowledge to know the environment at that time to understand the revelation of a verse, right? If I didn't know the people at that time rode camels, I'm like, what is God talking about? Go look at a camel. Obviously, I'll reinterpret the Quran in a different manner, won't I? Right? So when it said that, he, that students addressed him in this manner, he stopped. Yeah? Ishaq al-Kindi stopped. And he says, who told you this? Who told you this? They said, no, we got it. They're like, no, 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 I know you. You could not have come up with this. Tell me, where did you get this? To which they replied, from the house of Imam Hassan al-Askari alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So he replies back and he says, وَمَا كَانَ لِيَخْرُجُ مِثْلَ هَذَا إِلَّا مِنْ ذَلِكَ الْبَيْتِ yeah? He says, now you have spoken the truth for this type of knowledge can only come from that particular house. Yeah? And he said that Ishaq al-Kindi at that moment, إِنَّهُ دَعَى بِالنَّارِ وَأَحْرَقَ جَمِيعَ مَا كَانَ أَلَّفَهُ He says he gathered a fire and burnt everything that he had written about the Tanakhuz of the Qur'an. This is some of the impact of our Imam, yeah? immediate impact. But from that there are so many lessons. Right? Look at the akhlaq of the way the Imam did it. Yeah? The Imam could have done this himself. He could have written a letter to him. Right? But right away when somebody has ego, it's very difficult for them to accept haq. Yeah? When somebody is arrogant, we talked about this yesterday, isn't it? When somebody has takabbur, they can't accept haq. Even if haq slaps them on the face, they won't be able to accept haq. Yeah? So the Imam salam had to soften the blow. Right? Remember we talked about this, I think, my teacher told me this. He says, if you want to reprimand somebody, you can't just go around slapping people. Yeah? You can't. But what you do is you rub them gently on the back. Yeah? Rub them gently and then slap them once. Yeah? But then you rub them again right away. So they don't realize they've been slapped. Yeah? And then you rub again gently and then you slap again. Yeah? And then you rub again. This is the way you, you, you influence people. Yeah? Now he's not talking about physical slapping, right? But uh, you understand what I'm saying, right? That you can't just be aggressive, ah, nobody's going to accept that. 
but you have to do it in a manner that's going to be acceptable by them. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Ya Ali. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I want to spend the rest of the time that we have discussing a few hadith of the Imam. It's just a potpourri of hadith, to be quite honest. Because when I was reading the text or trying to prepare this lecture, the Imam, um, like every other Imam, has profound hadith. Yeah, profound hadith which will shape our lives up. So there's no particular topic. It's just the words of our Imam. Yeah, and let us enjoy them and let us maybe take something from them. One of the things that our Imam salam emphasized was the importance of living in a state of equilibrium or balance or what is known in Arabic as i'tidal yeah? um, to, to live Remember, in the ilm of, of akhlaq when we talked about this in the first um, year that I was here we talked about jihad and nafs when we talk about ilm al akhlaq there are certain things that have been described to us that we've been created with we've been created with the power of desire we've been created with the power of intellect we've been created the power of anger isn't it yeah and then of course there's a power of imagination as well with all of these powers we can either go to two different extremes ifrat and tafrit if we go to either extremes we have gone away from the state of balance right the aim is that we bring back our emotions we bring back our desires and bring it back to the center so that we are in a state of balance and it is this balance that will get us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Imam describes this very beautifully in this hadith. He says, لِسَّخَا مِقْدَارًا فَإِن زَادَ عَلَيْهِ فَهُوَ صَرَفْ He says, generosity has a limit. Yeah? And when you cross the limit of generosity, you do israf. Yeah? You begin to waste, the Imam says. Right? So it's, it's, this is very profound. Yeah? How much do I, again, there's no, I wish I could say you, 50, you, 100. No, it's nothing like that. You judge for yourself, right? That where is it where now I am being wasteful with what I am doing? It may depend on my bank balance. If my bank balance is large, yes, I'm expected to give more, right? But depending on myself, where I am, um, I cannot become too extreme in my giving. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, do not stretch your hand all the way nor close it to your next but stretch it in a way where you um, are not doing injustice to anybody now I paraphrase God didn't say it like that but the Imam salam here describes the state of balance that is required in the lives of human beings and he continues and he says hazmi miqdaran fa in zada alayhi fa huwa jubun. Yeah? he says that caution caution has a limit and when you cross that you become a coward yeah? there are people who don't want to take chances yeah? People who say, no, no, let's just wait. Yeah? Let's just be careful. Let's just not do this. Let's not, let's not make waves. There are times when that's the right thing to do. But there are times when because of that, you will be looked at as a coward by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for not standing up and doing what is right. And then he continues. He says, وَلِلْإِقْتِسَادْ مِقْدَارًا فَإِن زَادَ عَلَيْهِ فَهُوَ بخيل. Yeah, And he says that thriftiness has a balance. Yeah, has a limit and when you cross that limit you become a miser yeah? so it's not on one end where you give so much where you become wasteful but on the other hand if you don't give you're considered to be a miser yeah? you're considered to be one who is بخيل فَإِن زَادَ عَلَيْهِ and then the last one is وَلِلشُّجَاعَ مِقْدَارًا فَإِن زَادَ عَلَيْهِ فَهُوَ تَهَوُّرْ yeah? and he says that courage has a limit and when it is crossed you become foolhardy yeah? that means you're one who rushes into mistakes all the time this beautifully describes to us he just described four things here right but it describes to us the importance of remaining in a state of balance in, in, in Islam in Islam whenever we go to an extreme we have gone away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so even like simple things right like if one just spends all day reciting namaz 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 You've gone to an extreme, yeah, because you're neglecting the responsibilities of your family, you're neglecting the economic responsibilities that are on you, 
Yeah? Um, you're neglecting probably many other things. Likewise, if you fast all day, all day, every day, every day, and spend all night praying, you're definitely neglecting your family. You're definitely neglecting your other responsibilities. There's a balance that is expected. And this is why for those who are fasting mustahab fast, it is more mustahab to break that fast when somebody invites you for a meal. Yeah? Showing us what? There are other responsibilities that we have as Muslims. It's not just myself and my own spiritual um, um, beating of this, right? So we have to find that there's this balance that exists. And this is why we find that we've, there's hadith um, that say that the Imams, like for example, Imam Ali alayhi salam prayed a thousand rakat every night. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I'm not denying those hadith, yeah? Um, but by, by time, let's look at time, right? When we pray a hundred rakat here, how long does it take us? Yeah, three hours maybe, yeah? But let's just say an hour and a half. I've done it in an hour and a half, yeah? Uh, not to say I'm fast or anything, but I've done it in an hour. It was a little fast. Um, hour and a half for a hundred. Now you multiply that by ten. How many is that? Fifteen hours. If the Imam was in Salah for 15 hours, yeah, when did he govern? Yeah? When did he go out and feed the needy every night? Yeah? When did he go play with orphans? Yeah? When did he go console widows? Yeah? Um, this thousand hadith, I'm not saying it's a wrong hadith. He may have done it once a week. Allahu alam. Yeah? But my point here is it could be describing to us something in a different realm. Like giving sadaqah is worth a thousand rakats in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? Taking care of my family is worth a thousand rakat in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we have to look at these things, right? Intellectually, same thing when we look at Karbala. Imam Hazrat Abbas or Hazrat Ali Akbar killed 50,000. Hazrat Ali Akbar killed 500. Look at the time, look at the time, yeah? We have to be realistic with what we are saying and how we explain these narrations that we have, right? Because time-wise, none of these things make sense then. So I'm not trying to like debunk or defunct these things, but we have to look at it um, from a very intellectual point of view and try to understand what's important. Societal care is more important than Salah and Siyam, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Because this is what we have been put on earth for. We have been put on earth as the Khulafa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To look after the affairs of Allah's creation. Yeah? Not just my own namaz. Not just my own salah. So we find that this balance, this i'tidal, is what is expected to, of us from every aspect of life. It was beautifully described by the Imam alayhi salam. In another fascinating hadith, yeah? the Imam alayhi salam instructs us on that which is more important than life and death. This is a very beautiful hadith. I had to like read it a few times and ponder quite a bit over it. He says, خَيْرٌ مِنَ الْحَيَاتِ إِذَا فَقَدْتَهُ أَبْغَذْتَ الْحَيَاتِ وَشَرٌ مِنَ الْمَوْتِ مَا إِذَا نَزَلَ بِكَ أَحْبَبْتَ الْمَوْتِ He says, better than life, better than life, is that which if you lose, it would cause you to hate life. Beautiful. Yeah? Better than life, more important than life, is that which if I lose, I would hate to live life. Yeah? And worse than death, is that which if it were to befall you, it would make you wish for death. Subhanallah. Yeah? Subhanallah. What does that mean? Oh, it means so many things. Yeah? It means so many things. Um, I don't know, I have so many hadiths, I, I, I think I'm just going to tell you guys these hadiths and you guys ponder over it inshallah, yeah? But I'll read this again, this is a profound hadith, yeah? One of the most profound hadiths I've come across. Better than life is that which if you lose, yeah, it will cause you to hate life. Yeah? I think this will tell us what's important to us. If I lose a job, people will say, oh, I can't live this life. People break up with their girlfriends, oh, I can't live this life. Yeah? This is more important to them than their lives. Yeah? But for us, it's what? Yeah? Religion, yeah? our deen. My brothers and sisters, if we lose our deen, this life is worthless. Worthless. Yeah? Um, yeah? Remember this hadith of this man who comes to our imam and says, I am poor. Yeah? He says, I have nothing, imam. So the imam he says, here, I have 
two bags of gold, sell me your religion and I give this to you. He says, no, I would never do that. So the Imam is saying, you are so rich, you don't want two bags of gold, what are you complaining about? Yeah? What are you complaining about? We are, if we lose our religion, it would make us hate life. Yeah? This is what, our, what is expected of us anyways. Right? And worse than death, what's worse than death that if it were to befall me, I would hate, I would look forward to death. Yeah? What do you think that is? Huh? Masiya? Yeah, it could be. Yeah? It could be oppression. Yeah? Hopelessness. It could be um, poverty. Yeah? Poverty is mawtul akbar, as Imam says. Yeah? It could be different types of bala that could befall me. So what the Imam salam here is saying is that look at your life. Yeah? Gauge where you at, make sure you have your priorities on straight so that you don't mess up at the long at the end of the day. I'll end with this hadith. Yeah, there's so much more. The Imam it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing that twenty eight years is all he lived, yeah. And this is what the, the Athar, this is what is left for us. This wealth of knowledge yeah, coming from our Imam. I'll end with this hadith. And I think this hadith is beautiful. The reason this hadith is beautiful is because it simplifies life. Okay? He says, the most, I'll read, it in, I'll read it in Arabic because that's the language they spoke it in. Awra'un nas man waqafa in the shubha a'budun nas man aqama ala al-fara'id azhadun nas man tarak al-haram He's describing um, characteristics which are highly praised in Islam. Like he's describing who is awra, who is the most pious. Yeah? He's describing who is a'bad, the best of worshippers. He's describing azhad, the ones who are most zahid, the ones who are most detached from dunya. Yeah? He says the most pious are those who don't approach suspicious matters, yeah? who go away from suspicious matters. The best worshippers are those who perform their wajibat. Yeah? The most zahid, the most ascetic people are those who avoid haram. <coughs> That's it. Yeah? Look at how easy life is. Yeah? There's no glitz or, gram or glamour or you have to do this and you have to do that and you have to study Irfan and you have to do, oh, you have to believe in this and oh, nothing, nothing. Yeah? You have to do that which is expected of you. Do the wajibat, you'll be considered to be the best worshipper in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? You avoid the haram, you'll be considered to be the most zahid in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to add an extra step, you don't approach that which is suspicious, yeah? which is doubtful. So you don't go to doubtful restaurants. Yeah? Like uh, people come and ask me all the time, Mulana, is this restaurant halal? Is this halal? I say, brother, we live in Brampton and Mississauga. Yeah? There is no need to go to doubtful restaurants in Brampton and Mississauga. Yeah? You can trip on a certified halal restaurant in Brampton and Mississauga and fall into it. Why go to something doubtful? Yeah? Why go to a place where it's doubtful? Why music? Same thing. Molana, is this allowed? Molana, is this music allowed? Why go into doubtful things, man? You can live life without music. Yeah? Even suspicious music. Like, I don't want to mention names, I don't want to be a killjoy on a kushali. Um, <laughs> but you know what I mean, yeah? Uh, avoid all music. All music, whether they are singing halal songs, they are singing about the Prophet, they are singing about Imam Ali, doesn't matter. Yeah? What if it's not allowed in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What if? Just what if? Yeah? Why take a chance? The most pious, this is where piety comes in, are those who don't, who don't approach suspicious matters. They don't approach it. Yeah? And this, I think, highlights for us the simplicity of what is expected of us. And again, there's so much more. Alhamdulillah, I have material for next time, inshaAllah. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He hastens the return of our living Imam. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that for those who are going through difficulty, that He end their difficulty. For those who have asked us to remember them in our prayers, Ya Allah, please accept their hajat. And lastly, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that peace and security are returned to the lands of Samarra so that we can go visit, insha'Allah. Wa akhiru da'wan and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallillahumma ala sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammad wa alihi tahirin.